Sometimes I daydream about what it would be like to preach only happy things. You know, like, like come in front of you and stop worrying about the Bible or trying to encourage people to be more Christ-like and just tell you things you want to hear. You know, like, and just make f- people feel good. I think maybe I'd be good at it. You know, like, like become one of those trendy megachurch pastors with lots of money and every service is basically just a big motivational pep rally. You know, just kind of ignore the whole Jesus of it all and just make people feel good. <laughs> Don't worry about how God wants us to live or reading this book to find out the truth about what's out there and what God expects of us. I think it would probably be easier, probably, if my job was to keep you happy rather than to encourage you to be holy. It would be a lot easier for me to give you the world, maybe, rather than to give you the good news about God. Problem is, only one of those is actually valuable. Today is part four in our whole sermon series called The Shift. Um, What we've been doing for the whole month of September is we've been taking apart the different expectations of membership in the church. We've been talking about, you know, we we are told that we need to do a lot of things in the Christian life. And so we are asking the question, why? You know, we, we've got all this big list of things that we're supposed to do. You've got to go to church. You've got to read your Bible. You've got to pray. You've got to give money. You've got to volunteer. And, and if we, and they're not bad things, right? Those are all very good things to do. But if we don't know why, then we don't have that motivation. We won't have that passion to actually get it done. And so today we are looking at the issue of giving money. Yeah, now this is a tricky one because money in the church is a really complicated thing. It's a very touchy subject. A couple weeks ago, we did this like little historical survey where we covered 2,000 years of church history in 15 minutes. Um, And when we did that, one of the things we touched on was the deep corruption in the Catholic church. And we talked about, you know, how a lot of that was centered around money. And even though we had the Reformation, right, we moved past a lot of that, money troubles in the church remain. We still have these issues. Now, I'm very grateful. The Methodist Church, the United Methodist Church, actually has a lot of policies put in place to keep their leaders, people like me, from misusing the funds. I don't know if you guys know that, but we actually have a lot. Now, I'm not trying to say that we're a perfect system, right? There's always the possibility of corruption. So we got to be vigilant. We have to pay attention to that. But um, yeah, we actually have a really great system of checks and balances to keep leaders in line. Um, I have a credit card for church expenses, right? I have a card that I can use to purchase things for the church and do the ministry of the church. Um, But I have to have uh, a receipt for every single thing I spend money on, and I have to relate that to our budget. I got to like fill out this form where every single thing goes into a category, um, and they have to approve that. And other than that card, I have no access to the funds of this church. I literally can't get to the money. I have to put in a request, and then someone else has to approve it, right, and stamp in, and sign the check and all that stuff. I have no way to get to the money. The people who count our money, well, by the way, we have a phenomenal team who counts the money. It's like four or five people. They rotate who does it. It's about three of them every week. And they come in every Monday morning and count the money, or sometimes Sunday or whatever. They, they count the money, but they do it in front of security cameras. And the people who count the money are not the same people who keep the records, right? They turn in the form, and then the QuickBooks is monitored by a different person. And that person is different than the person who signs the checks. We have this very rigid system of checks and balances to keep us away from corruption. Um, and the reason for all that, and actually we go even further than that. Now, I don't know if you guys know, now giving is confidential, right? We're never going to share who gives what, because that's private, right? That's nobody's business. But um, giving is confidential, but if you wanted to come in and see what we do with the money in the church, um, you have access to that. If any person just off the street can walk in and look at the finances of this church, um, now, it's not particularly interesting. Uh, you know, it's, it's a lot to look at. It's this big financial report. We have, it's updated every month. And so we have the August report literally stapled and hanging on a clipboard on the wall of the office. Anyone has access to that. Now, at the first service, I said it's not particularly interesting. Uh, and the chair of finance got a little upset. But uh, <laughs> just about every, like, it's, not, it's a lot to look at. But my point here is that we have nothing to hide. 
we will show you anything you want to know about the budget except who gives what, right? Uh, because that, that we have to be completely transparent in the modern world because I believe that the church has lost people's trust. We have lost people's trust by mishandling funds and stressing people out with money and all this kind of stuff. And so we have the hard job. We have the uphill battle of regaining people's trust, of earning people's trust. And I believe the way to do that is by being completely transparent with our money. If you have any questions or curiosities, you come talk to me. We'll sit down and I'll explain the whole thing to you. All right, so um, I want to be completely straightforward and authentic with you. But there is serious tension between religion and money. This is a really hard issue. The church has made a lot of mistakes in the past, and so we have to be very careful moving forward in the future. Now, our scripture in Mark um, is a story about Jesus, and it gets started in verse 41. And it says, He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. And many rich people put in large sums. So let me, let me paint you a picture a little bit, all right? Now, in this time, they didn't pass around the offertory plate like we did. They had a treasury. It was like a box that they had at the entrance of the temple, and you would, jump, you, know, you would dump your gift. You'd put your gift in the box as you were headed into the temple. Now, <laughs> Jesus goes in, and he just plops himself down across from the treasury and is watching people put money in the box. First of all, I think that's a little rude, right? Like he's just sitting there watching how much are you going to put in, you know? Like he's watching people, and then a bunch of rich people come, and they put a lot of money in there. Okay, so so far so clear. Um, so then it says, a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. And then he calls his disciples, and he said to them, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury. So... <laughs> So, so rich people come in and put in a whole bunch of money into the treasury, right? They put a whole bunch of money, and a widow comes in and puts in a penny, what, like two little coins that are worth one penny. And then Jesus says, she put in the most. Now, of course, this is very embarrassing for Jesus. He has to go back to accounting school, right? Because clearly, a big, large amount of money is not more than a penny, right? I mean, think about this. Is there anyone in the room who would prefer a penny instead of a large sum of money. I'm just checking for liars, you know, okay. Uh, no, but it's, 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 a t it's so far in this story, all we have learned is that Jesus is terrible with math, right? He just said, no, you can't have a large amount of money, penny, right? Jesus, you're not making any sense. Think about all the good you could do with a large amount of money, right? You could print so many more church bulletins with a large chunk of, right, right, with a rich person's gift rather than the widow's gift. Using the math of the world, using the system of accounting that we have in this life, Jesus is wrong. He keeps going in verse 44, and he says, For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, everything she had to live on. So rich people are giving out of their surplus, out of their extra, and the poor woman put in everything. And then it clarifies everything she had to live on. So now we see in the modern culture, in our understanding, we look at this story and we say, okay, the rich people are being really smart, right? They're giving out of their extra. This poor widow's being an idiot, right? I call me a liar. Is there anyone in this room who would suggest that a poor widow should put everything she owns into the plate? <laughs> Isn't this how we look at giving? Take care of your business, right? Take care of your stuff, and then with the extra, with whatever's left over, then you can make yourself feel good by giving to charities or to church or whatever. <sighs> Jesus' is teaching doesn't make any sense. It doesn't line up with how we understand the world. It's funny. I think this is a familiar story. How many of you guys know the story of the widow with the two coins, right? Some of you have heard this before, right? Some of you have heard this story, and yet we don't actually believe it, right? You wouldn't follow this advice, would you? This is one of those moments where I think Christians know the Bible. We just don't believe it. So, something is wrong with this passage. It doesn't make any sense to us unless Jesus is using some other kind of value system than the rest of the world. A large sum of money is not more than a penny unless it is not about the amount. 
A penny is not more than a large sum of money. Jesus does, Jesus does not want a portion of your abundance. Jesus wants all of who you are. Right? Now, I'm not talking about money anymore. Jesus does not want your extra. He does not want your surplus, maybe, if I have time at the end of my life. Jesus wants everything you are. He wants you to give everything to him, everything you've got to live on. Put it all in front of Jesus. It, the amount doesn't matter. The priority matters. So ask yourself, do you bring your leftovers to God? Like, is that how you do church? Maybe if I've got time at the end of all things, do you bring your leftovers? Or is God part of your first fruits? Are you giving out of your first fruit? Is God the first thing to come off your schedule when time gets tight? Is he the first thing that comes out of your budget when money gets tight? Because the gospel, it's not about money. It's not about amounts, right? It's not trying to take a chunk of your paycheck. It wants more than that. It wants all of who you are. Jesus doesn't want your leftovers. It takes everything we are. Now, before we move on, I should say, this little story, before we get to the story of the widow who gives everything, Jesus has this moment where he warns the scribes of the church. He says that they are not doing what they're supposed to do. The scribes are not taking care of widows like they're supposed to. That's what he says right before the widow shows up. Then right after that, he predicts the destruction of the temple. And so what we find is that this story about the widow giving everything to God, this story is framed inside a warning about corruption in the institutional church, in the organized religion. Jesus was not messing around with this stuff. Our second scripture tells the other story about money that most people have already heard of. Right? Have you guys heard of the story of the rich young ruler? Anybody familiar? Some of you? Okay. Uh, and so then it goes, it goes like this. It says, someone came to him and said, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. So this guy walks up to Jesus and he says, all right, what do I got to do to go to, go to the place where the goody-goodies go, right? What do I got to do to go to heaven? And Jesus says, it's not about what you do. It's about who you know. Well, that's not exactly what he says, but he, he, he switches it. He says, why are you asking me about good? There is only one who is good. Did you catch that, the way he switches the word? It's about who is good because be, get, getting to heaven, salvation has never been about good deeds. It's about our connection to Jesus. It's about our connection to the Savior of our soul. And so then it says, um, and so then he changes the question. Jesus says, okay, but to enter into life, keep the commandments. And so then the rich young ruler, he continues, he's basically like a mascot for legalism at this point, and he says, all right, which rules? <laughs> like, like uh, give me the lowdown. Which rules do I have to follow to, to enter into life to, to be a good person? And Jesus rattles off a whole bunch of them. He says, um, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear fault with me, honor your father and mother, also you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now what's funny to me is that these are the easy rules to follow. Jesus is listing all of the stuff that society uses to decide whether you're a good person or not. Like that's all that list is. It's the basics. It's really easy. It's not a way to earn heaven, but it's a good way to live life. Right? He says, don't steal, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't lie, and be nice to people. If you do that stuff, most people will like you. It's not going to get you to heaven, right? But it, it will get you into life. If you do that stuff, most people will like you. And then we get to verse 20. Now, verse 20 is the most important verse in the whole chapter. It says, verse 20, the young man said, I have kept all of these. What do I still lack? And the reason that that verse is so important is because I don't think we ask that question in this world anymore. What do I still lack? Most of us, we just want the little list of rules, right? We just want whatever's going to make us look good in society. What will make people like me? You know, that little list of rules. That's all we want, and then we're good. We don't want to ask Jesus, okay, but what do I still lack? Even if the world thinks I'm a good person, even if I got all them fooled, what do I still lack? And Jesus gives it to him. He says, all right. He says, if you wish to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions. Give your money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And when the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. 
sell all your stuff, give the money to the poor. I was thinking about this when I was writing the sermon a couple weeks ago, and I was thinking, what? you know, it says that he, he, looked, he went away grieving. And for so long, scholars and pastors and just about everybody, we read that passage and we assume he did not do it, right? He went away grieving because he had a lot of stuff. And so we assume he did not sell his stuff. We assume that he never uh, followed Jesus. But ask yourself, what if he did? What if he did follow Jesus? Maybe he was grieving because he had a lot of stuff, and that's perfectly understandable, but then he still chose. Why do we assume that grieving means he did not follow Jesus? Is it because in our lives, if something makes us grieve, if something is uncomfortable, if something would cause us to sacrifice, we don't do it? (laughs) I remember years ago, I preached on this text the story of the rich young man, right? And I preached on that story, and I, I was, <laughs> I almost said I was young. I, <laughs> I, I went in front of this congregation, it must have been like my first, um, like one of the first years of ministry ever, right? And I got in front of them, and I had just become a pastor, and I remember reading this text, and I read it, and I figured, well, the most obvious application is that we should probably sell our stuff and give it to the poor. Like, we should get rid of some of our stuff and sell it to the poor. But I remember people from that congregation came to me, and they were like, you, you don't really think that that's what it means, right? Like, they don't really want us to sell our stuff and give it to the poor, do they, right? And I wanted them to like me. I wanted to do a good job in my early stages, right? And so I, I got in front of that congregation, and in a moment of cowardice, I muted the message. I don't even remember what I told them, but I remember that I tried to make them feel good. I remember that my goal was not to give them the truth, but was to just sort of, oh no, that's not really what it means. Don't worry, don't worry. That's not what it I wanted to make them happy. I wanted to make them feel better. But now, today I'm reading this text, and I'm wondering, what if that's what God meant? What if that is what God is calling us to do, to sell all of our stuff? What if God asked you to empty your bank account, sell your house, sell all your stuff, your couches, your TV, give everything away, give all your money to the poor? Would your response be any different than the rich young ruler? Right? Because I remember growing up, I used to feel bad for the rich young ruler. I was like, oh, it's so sad. He's so greedy. Right? He's got all his stuff, and it's got such a hold on him. Jesus really wants him to, you know, he wants him to follow Jesus and focus on God completely. I used to think I was better than the rich young rulers. You ever have that feeling? That's what I used to think. I used to look down on the rich young ruler, that poor greedy little guy. And now I'm considering it in my life. If God asked me to empty my bank account and sell all my stuff and sell my couch, sell my TV, (laughs) sell all my things to follow him, I love Jesus with all of my heart, but I would grieve because I got a lot of stuff, and I really like that stuff. (laughs) If you live in modern America, it's not like money might be an idol for your life. All right? It's not like you maybe struggle with the love of money. Money is an idol for every single human being in this room. Our culture demands it. To exist in American culture, you have to have money be an idol. Jesus knew that was going to be a problem. That's why he talked about money so much. God uses different math than the rest of the world, and it is so hard for us to see things God's way instead of our way, the world's way. See, the good news for us this morning is that God reveals value. God pulls back the curtain and shows us. He uses different financial math than the rest of the world. Let me see if I can explain it this way. You ever go to a doctor for the, like an annual checkup, right? And then they'll poke and prod you and they'll ask you the same question. Does this hurt? Does this hurt? How about now? Right? And, and, there's, and so when we cry out, right, one of two things has happened. Either the doctor is pushed too hard, right, without the right sensitivity, or more likely something is wrong. And the doctor will say, my friend, we're going to have to run some more tests. It's not supposed to hurt there. And so when God teaches us about money and we start to cry out 
in discomfort. You know, we criticize the message. We criticize the scripture. We say, Jesus, you're wrong. That widow, was, she was being an idiot. When we start to criticize that, one of two things has happened. Either Jesus is pushing too hard or, more likely, something is wrong in our hearts. And the great physician will turn to us and say, my friend, we're going to have to run some more tests. It's not supposed to hurt there. God reveals to us where the real value in life is found, and it's different than what the world promises us. There is a transformation of character. There is a molding of your heart that God intends to work out in us. I would argue that we start out as generous. Like, we are more giving as children, right? We are more um, naturally giving, just sort of instinctively. But then we start to learn the habits of self-interest. We start to learn the habits of greed, right? My three-year-old is less giving than my one-year-old. He's only three, and he's already picking up the habits of greed. And God's project in our hearts is to undo the damage the world has done to us. God reveals value. And so our response is to store up treasure in heaven. The rich young man was told, sell all your stuff, give it to the poor, take care of the poor, and that's how you store up treasure in heaven. You see, the mental shift I want you to make this morning is that giving in the church is not about the church, right? Giving at all. It's not about the church's need. Giving is about the need in your heart to grow more generous. God wants to cultivate a generous heart in your life, and the practice of giving, that accomplishes that for us. That's why it's a percentage and not a set amount. It's not about the money. Jesus was not impressed with the rich people who gave these big chunks of money because that kind of giving did not get down into their soul. That kind of giving did not reach their heart, and all Jesus really cared about was their heart. Mother Teresa once said, if you give what you don't need, You're not really giving. God wants to create a generous spirit in your life, and the practice of giving accomplishes that. It works on our heart. A long time ago, churches taught something called the tithe. You guys heard of that? The tithe, right? Give 10% of your income. 10% of your income goes right to the church. The Bible's actually very specific about it. It says 10%, the first fruits of your labor, goes to the temple. It, it's how you feed the priests and keep the temple operational. Like, that was the way they did it. And in fact, in that time, it was 10% goes to the church, and everything above that is what they gave to the poor, right? So that's how the system used to work. Um, but over time, partially because of that corruption that we talked about, over time, there was significant pushback against the tithe, right? They said, well, anybody who's pushing for 10% is being legalistic, right? Anybody who's pushing for 10%, we, we, they're, they're not focused, you know? It's kind of funny because they said, you know, Jesus never talked about the tithe. Jesus never talked about 10%. And I was like, you know what? You're right. I'm reading these two stories that we just read today. Jesus did not talk about 10%. How much did he want the rich man to give? A hundred percent. How much did the poor widow give when Jesus complimented her? A hundred percent. You know, 10 percent sounds pretty good. You see it? Jesus wants all of us. Jesus didn't talk about 10 percent. But no, 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 no. It's not about the percentage. It should be about our hearts. It should be about a generous heart and joyful giving, a generous spirit. And so a lot of churches, we stop talking about the tithe. You know, we stopped talking about 10%. We started talking more vaguely about just joyful giving and and having a generous heart. Would you like to know what happened? Let me throw some numbers at you. Let's play a little game, okay? Now, I know some people don't like numbers, but I find them very helpful. And I'm going to do some rounding to make it simpler, but follow with me on this, okay? Average income in Flushing, Michigan in uh, 2018, last year, that's the data we have available, is $43,000. Right, so average income in this city is forty thousand dollars. I'm gonna round down forty thousand dollars. Nope, you're good. Can we still hear me? Forty thousand dollars. Right now, obviously, some people make a lot more than that, and some people make a lot less than that. But that's what it comes out to as an average, right? Forty thousand dollars in Flushing, Michigan. Okay, forty thousand. Ten percent of forty thousand dollars is four thousand dollars. It's really easy math. You just move the decimal, right? So four thousand dollars. This church has 328 members. 
328 adults who could be giving, right? 328 possible giving people. Let's round down to 300, right? Let's assume we got a bunch of college kids or something. You know, they can't be given. So 300. I want you to see that I'm rounding down every time. $4,000 per year times 300 people. Anybody know what the annual budget of this church could be? Anyone doing the fast math in their head? Yeah, yeah. Not quite, not quite. There's one zero too many. $4,000 times 300 people is an annual budget of $1,200,000. Let me just put that number in front of you for a second. $1,200,000 if everyone gave 10%. Does anybody know what the actual budget of this church is? I'm looking for my finance people. Half, no, I don't know. Three hundred thousand dollars. Ah, so close, guys. <laughs> Only nine hundred thousand dollars short. Now, I don't want you to feel bad about that. Okay, that's not my point. I'm not trying to make anyone feel guilty. I want you to dream with me for a second. I want you to dream and imagine, right? $300,000. What? Imagine what this church would be capable of within it. Is he okay? Okay, okay. It's like. <laughs> He just collapsed. I just want to make sure he's cool. <laughs> Imagine what this church is doing, could do with an extra $900,000 in our budget. Oh, I know, bud. It's really sad. You guys know that, that major building project that we're talking about with the trustees, right? We want to renovate the whole front end of this. We could do that paid off in one year without even blinking. We could fund the entire Family Promise program, the whole program, all by ourselves, right? We could send literally 10 times the missionary support that we are currently sending in this church, and that's just in one year's budget, right? You know what I would love to do? I would love to walk into the school district offices and say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pay for the kids' lunches. Like, wouldn't that be amazing just to walk in and just be like, we're going to take care of it because we love these kids and we love our community. <laughs> our budget is 25% of what it could be, which means that on average, our people are giving about 2.5% of their income. Anybody know what uh, the national average for giving is for religious and non-religious people? 2.5%. <laughs> and I rounded down... Right? So we are less generous than the rest of our country. Now, I'm not trying to make you guys feel bad, I promise. Um, <laughs> um, we became focused on joyful giving. We became focused on cultivating a generous spirit. And in the end, we became drastically less generous. And I don't think we're more happy like than we were 20, 30, 50 years ago, right? I don't think we're more happy, which means, which is weird, because according to our culture, if you keep more for yourself, you should be happier, right? And yet I don't see that. The hard truth that I want to put you in front of you this morning is that we as a church have failed to cultivate a generous heart. We have not done it well. Okay, now let me soften it, okay? Because I still want you to like me. <laughs> <laughs> All right? I completely understand. And you should know that those numbers are not unusual. That's, about, that's the problem that every single church in this country is dealing with. And honestly, I've been a part of a lot of churches. Compared to some of them, like there was a church I was a part of in Chicago. They had a huge budget. But compared to that, we're very generous. Because when they played this game and did the numbers, it was much worse. I want to soften it. Oh, and so I completely understand. Basically, every church in America has numbers that look like those numbers. And I get it. I completely understand. I don't want anyone to feel guilty. That is not my purpose here today. Okay, I have struggled with my giving as well. Okay, I want to be completely, all right, let's just put this out there. In the spirit of authenticity, right, let me just put this out there, okay? I make $48,000. From this church that's my salary from this church now that's before taxes so $48,000 and I have to send 30% into the government right I make $48,000 now according to the flushing average my family's doing great right we are above average we have food on the table we're doing wonderful I have no complaints about my salary okay that's not my point $48,000 10% move the decimal is $4,800 a year now that works out to about $200 every couple weeks. So twice a month, we give 
$200. That's the tithe in my house. Just, I'm just focused on my salary because it's simply, right? Um, but last year, we had a baby, and we moved 400 miles to a new city and a new town, and we were stressed about money. And so my family, we, we backed off on our giving. Now, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but I'm trying to be totally authentic with you, okay? We, in our house, we just stopped giving completely for about six months. We just, we couldn't. We felt like we couldn't. We could have, but we felt like we couldn't. And so I put it in front of the SBRC, which is this committee that keeps me accountable. I put it in front of them, and I said, this is my goal. In 2019, I want to get us back up to 10%, right? We, I want us to be giving regularly again. And it took some time. Right? We wanted to pay off our medical bills, and we wanted to feel more comfortable, and so we started increasing our giving, and in about May or June, we did it. We got back up to 10%, right? And so we now have an automated payment that sends $200 to this church twice a month. Well, okay, full honesty here. Uh, the automated payment is not set up correctly, so the money keeps bouncing back to me. Um, little sneak, little sneak peek, though, okay? Automated online wire transfers are coming, I'm using myself as a guinea pig. I'm trying to figure out how it works. <laughs> That's not my point, okay? Now, I know some people will ask me, they'll be like, why are you giving money back to the church that pays you? That's really dumb, right? Like, why are you bothering to do that, right? They pay you. Why, why give back? And the answer from our scripture is so easy because I need to grow too, right? I'm the same as you guys. I need generosity in my heart. I need God to work on molding my heart So, because it's not about the money. It's not about the amount. It's I want to, my spirit needs to grow. My heart needs to be molded by the practice of giving so that I become more generous because God has revealed that a generous heart is more important than what's in your bank account. All right. So all of this comes together with one final application. This is the last thing I'm going to say. This is my challenge to you this week. I want you to choose the path of generosity in your life that demands the most of you. Let me say that again. Choose the path of generosity that demands the most of you. Now, I'm not saying that everyone needs to sit down and calculate 10%. Um, you know, I'm not trying to be legalistic, although that's very helpful, right? That's very helpful as a starting point to see where you're at in the giving spectrum compared to the way it used to be. All I'm, I'm not advocating legalism. All I'm saying is that when we stopped sitting down and looking at the numbers, when we stopped looking at 10%, we became radically less generous as a people. I want us to do whatever creates a generous heart in your life. That's the challenge. Whatever in your life creates a generous heart. Choose the path of generosity that demands the most of you because the people who are a part of this church should become more generous as they go. Right? As we grow, we should become more generous because that's the kind of math that God uses. C.S. Lewis once said, I do not believe we can settle how much you should give. I am afraid that the only safe rule is to give more than you can spare. Choose the path that demands the most of you. We choose, give at a level where you feel it. Give at a level where you have to cut things out of your budget and move it around in order to put God first, to make him a priority. Give where you notice it in your life. Don't give your leftovers to God. Give your first fruit. Okay, we made it through the money sermon. Okay? Sometimes I daydream about what it would be like to preach happy things. What would it be if my goal was to just make everyone here like me? But here's the thing. I love you guys too much to teach you something that is worth less. I can't do it. I have to tell you the truth. The truth is, God uses different financial math than the world. He teaches us that a generous heart is worth more than money in the bank account. And so I'll leave you with this. May you choose the path of generosity that demands the most of you. May you give your entire life to Jesus. Offer him everything you have. Let God, offer God your heart and let him shape you into a generous human being. And may you find true value in the world by making God a priority. Amen.